I love the excitement in the room. Thank you very much. Um, my name is John Stomberg. I'm the Virginia Rice Kelsey 1961S Director of the Hood Museum of Art. And I'd like to start by pointing out that the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth is situated on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki peoples. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous peoples, and the museum and Dartmouth's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. My job right now is also to introduce the next panel, but before I do, I would like to point out that in celebration of Dartmouth's 250th anniversary, today is publication day, and we have just completed a book called The Hood Now, Art and Inquiry at Dartmouth. This is the result of a couple years of work and it looks forward. And um, the book was the result of collaboration at, at Dartmouth between many staff. I'd like to particularly thank Nils Nato and Alison Pagliozzo for putting this book together for us. Um, you can get it on Amazon very soon. Uh, and I highly recommend it because it, it tries to capture the spirit and the energy of the hood and where we're going and it's really looking forward rather than backwards. So The Hood Now, great reading. Um, okay, so uh, this morning we're going to kick off with a, a, a panel on academic museums, and I couldn't be more proud than bring up my colleague from Mount Holyoke College Art Museum, um, Tricia Paik, who is a specialist in contemporary art, uh, who worked extensively on uh, Ellsworth Kelly, knows our Ellsworth Kelly murals uh, intimately, and has taken the reins of a really fantastic deep collection at Mount Holyoke that traces its origins back to 1876, which is really kind of amazing. Um, so I will let her introduce her own panel, but please welcome Trisha Paik. Good morning. Uh, I am so thrilled. I think everyone is thrilled and honored to be here today. And I just want to extend a huge thanks to, to John and everyone to make the symposium possible. Um, I think everyone is just truly, imp I'm so truly impressed by the breadth of, uh, of um, the Dartmouth alumni in the museum profession, the art world. And can I just take a brief observation and quick comment? What was in the water for the classes of 01 to 06? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I did a count last night. There should be a total of 21 speakers and moderators, and 12 of the 21 are 01 to 06. So I just kudos to you and the professor. <laughs> I went a little bit nerdy. I counted. It was 57%, so you guys can have bragging rights. Uh, so for this panel on academic museums, um, uh, and our futures. Um, my four esteemed colleagues and I are going to be addressing what we think the future should be for academic museums. Indeed, what is our role and how we can stay relevant in changing times. And what we have done is we've crafted our panel in a specific order in order to build and hopefully uh, shape a fruitful conversation. So John Weddenhall will talk about the history and evolution of academic museums and how they've changed, how their mission has changed over the years. Juliette Bianca will address academic museums and their relationship with their parent institution as partners in change, how museums support, develop, and contribute to the museum, the mission of the college or university. And Kat Steinberg will focus on the relationship of academic museums with their various communities, how to curate and be relevant for distinct communities, distinct communities they serve. And then finally, Maggie will talk about how academic museums are leaders in shaping the future of museums in general. We're at the forefront, at least we believe we are, uh, and how, they, how that can be done from drawing from the central relationship with students. So to briefly set this panel a little bit more, I thought it'd be elucidating as well as a bit entertaining to go back to, a, to the past just a little bit, specifically to my own here at Dartmouth End of the Hood. And here are, for fun, my notebooks and notes from my two classes I took of many, Art History II, that began with the Renaissance, and one of my favorite all-time classes with Joy Kenseth on the Baroque. 
I have been lugging my beloved art history notes with me to New York, St. Louis, Indianapolis, South Hadley. I was like, why am I keeping this? And now I know why. It's to share with all of you today with only people here would really appreciate it. And, but the reason why I brought this was not to just show that I've archived my past, but is to walk down this memory lane to show you just how much academic museums have changed and how they engage with their parent institution with my case study. So in my first uh, art history class, the survey two that I took, we were asked to go to the hood to find a work from the Renaissance. So I chose this work um, uh, from then by Albert and Al or Albrecht Bouts or Boots. How do you say that? Bouts, thank you, Joy, she's still teaching me. Um, which has now unfortunately been downgraded to the workshop of Albert Bouts, which shows you that work is always still being done in academic museums. And this was the one and only time that I was sent officially to the hood um, for a class. And this is no, no, no kind of distrust of anything that was being done at the time. It was just not the mission at the time of the museum and, and the art history for students to come here regularly, which of course has since changed. And for further fun, here is my first art history Dartmouth paper um, with, with um, many remarks and notes of criticism throughout the paper, which I'm not sharing with you, um, by uh, Catherine Turrell, now Turrell Lupi. And then who says art history is easy? It's not a gut class. Because here you see, she actually gave me a B minus, but she felt badly, so you can see she whited out the minus sign. But over age, it's shown the red mark, the minus has shown over time. So she had more comments, I mean, it's really pretty, this is far better than either of your essay exams, but still poses an occasional grammatical and organizational problem. So you can see I've come far <laughs> in my time, and I was hoping to show to students, you all have a future if you get to be in art history, but I don't see that many students here today, at least right now. So I just want to show you as an example of how far we've, ch how far we've gone and, and how academic museums um, uh, engage with their parent institution is something that John will be talking about and I just want to share briefly before I introduce John that this is of course very similar to the experiences we offer at the Mount Holy College Art Museum as John Stomberg knows um, intimately um, where we are always engaging with curating shows for teaching we're always pulling objects daily for classes um, and here uh, John's gonna remember um, uh, Aaron Miller uh, and here we have um, uh, classes uh, on collecting global antiquity, uh, remembrance and reconciliation. And um, you know, just 10 years ago at Mount Holyoke, we would never have been able to show the kind of data that we can boast now, where we have per year about 200 total class visits, 35 academic disciplines um, service per year, uh, 85, approximately 85 faculty members coming in and look at all the objects pulled. And um, I'm just so thrilled to be able to share with you the transformative ways that academic museums serve their institutions and so thrilled to have this conversation with you. So next up we have John Weddenhall. And just a quick um, summary here. We decided that all of you can look at your uh, bio handouts to learn more about our uh, backgrounds and experience. I'm just gonna give a very brief uh, introduction so we can share more time for talking because we have some things we wanna talk about with you. Um, but just to introduce John Weddenhall, 79. He's the founding director of the George Washington University Museum and Textile Museum, and the associate professor for the renowned graduate program in museum studies offered by George Washington University. John has his master's in art history from Williams College. So Dartmouth Mafia, not just Williams Mafia, um, from Williams College and his master's and PhD from Stanford, as well as his MBA uh, from Vanderbilt University. So John Weddenhall. I'm here for three reasons. One, is because Dartmouth had a commitment to foreign travel that allowed people like me who came to Dartmouth whose cultural experience was visiting grandparents on Miami Beach, an opportunity to see wonders of the world and then return to campus with a curiosity to learn more. Uh, two, because a donor left money for a student to graduate from Dartmouth to go abroad for a year to learn things to start their career. And 
I got sent to Italy uh, to learn the language, to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to ground my interest in the arts so that I could get into graduate school. I wasn't an art major, so I didn't have many credentials, but that helped. And three, and I've been to a lot of uh, universities, as you've heard, uh, because Dartmouth has a culture of teaching that other universities simply do not have. Teaching, mentoring, caring for your students and, and their careers. Uh, I, every person on this panel will have names that they can recall. Uh, mine were Jim Cox in the English department, uh, Nancy Vickers, who went on to become a uh, uh, professor, uh, uh, president of Bryn Mawr College, and then I was one of the early uh, uh, admittees to the uh, uh, the Admiration Society, of which many of you are members here. Yes, you, <laughs> Joy Kenseth. Uh, what I've what I've tried to put together for you today is uh, uh, a thought piece on university museums. Not all universities treasure and value their museums the way the Hood and Dartmouth College really does. Uh, and so it's important for some of us to reflect upon this, to think and to share some of the values and purposes of museums to, uh, uh, to help our colleagues uh, uh, fulfill their potential. And so I've tried to put together a little thought piece for the Hood's opening. So here goes. <clears throat> Imagine yourself a tourist visiting a campus of a major university. Where do you go? You can walk around the campus quadrangle and admire academic architecture, maybe take a tour for prospective students, but that's not you. The student center may be open if you like fast food, or maybe the bookstore to buy some logo merchandise. Doors to the dorms are normally locked. Classrooms are closed to the unregistered public, and you may need a college ID to enter the library. So where do you go to experience life on campus? You likely have three choices, a sports venue, a theater, both restricted by schedules, or open to all six or seven days a week, the University Museum. Our museums are the welcoming faces of our academic institutions. Our collections on display speak to the achievements and aspirations of our universities. Interpretive materials pronounce our commitment to teaching and research, and the energy and diversity of our visitors reflect the demographics and spirit of learning communities to which we contribute. Our museums, like our theaters and athletic venues, also maintain relationships between town and gown by offering lay people a means of participating in campus life without the imposition of tuition or a college loan. We improve the quality of life in our towns and our cities. We keep campus master plans moving through the zoning process, relieve civic overregulation, and occasionally help local authorities look beyond the exuberances of campus life. And something more, the public venues of our universities, whether they feature the exploits of college athletes, thespians, musicians, or visual artists, attract philanthropy particularly from people who never spent a minute in a single classroom on campus. In the old days, museums looked inward, building collections to bolster student learning. Some old master paintings, antiques, prints, photos, and drawings, even the work of a few modern painters, provided hands-on learning materials to supplement the old slide lecture with connoisseurship to train the discerning eye. The same held true for natural sciences, as specimen collections, often amassed through the field work of faculty experts, brought samples to campus, sparking curiosity that might even inspire new generations of scientific explorers. And of course, our libraries collected historical artifacts and rare books to supplement the learning and research of historians, literary scholars, and humanists across campus. Capacity became a challenge over time leading to larger galleries and storage vaults and standalone museums usually built in the red brick stone or painted wood vernacular of the rest of the college. Sometime, somehow, on many of our campuses, the passion and excitement of our professors and their charges spread to alumni and friends who contributed works of their own. Our predecessors welcomed their interest, invited them to lectures and openings, 
maybe even started membership programs to broaden this supportive base. Cash began to flow from the occasional check to annual dues to the capital campaign. Administrations learned that collections could bring prestige, as could relationships with the well-to-do people who tended to build them. The doorway to campus that museums had become for the general public now swung in both directions, as museums established entree for university officials to a portion of the 1% that had never experienced the wondrous rites of matriculation. More donations, more treasures, needs for more space, but now with the self-assurance that the edifice itself would represent the aspirations of alma mater to pronounce itself world class. Enter Louis Kahn. Hello, Frank Gehry. Welcome Michael Graves, Moore, Piano, Zaha Hadid, and Todd Williams and Billy Seen, of course. Back in the day when university museums were small but growing, leadership reached out for assistance in helping the overburdened staff. They invited artists, collectors, art dealers, and others with expertise and connections to serve on advisory boards that would visit campus once or twice a year to learn about museum exhibitions and programs in exchange for opinions and introductions that might prove helpful. Many, if not all, of these visiting committee members were alumni and so deepened bonds to the university and helped its museum extend its programmatic reach to ac an academic reputation beyond the boundaries of campus. I could go on about how such boards gradually assume the trappings of governance, in my opinion, counterproductively, but what is more important for us today are the people for whom these museums were really established, students and their faculty mentors. From 2006 to 8, I had the privilege of serving as chairperson of the University Affinity Group of the AAMD, the Association of Art Museum Directors. About 25 of us contributed to a survey to determine what we did to serve students and faculty. What did we find? Yale had a wonderful paid internship program interwoven throughout its museum's professional staff, as did Ohio State. BYU had amazing student visitation. Notre Dame scheduled every freshman to tour during orientation week. Princeton and Cornell attracted impressive student audiences. Dartmouth consistently persuaded professors to assign research projects using the collection. Florida and Harvard had vibrant student membership programs. Indiana offered quite a few classes in the museum. Michigan hosted student performances. Nine out of 26, including Georgia, Stanford, Rochester, Minnesota, and my Ringling Museum, which was an affiliate of Florida State University, all attracted over 100,000 visitors a year, some of us two or 300,000. Impressive, yes, but there was something unusual. While every museum offered a standout program for either faculty or students, not one appeared to be exceptional at more than one thing. Student internships here, faculty exhibits there. Freshman attendees or alumni groups, scholarly research or K through 12. Now, only 10 years later, this has profoundly changed. University museum leaders have discovered how to serve broad and diverse segments of academic communities, students, faculty, staff, parents, and alumni, all at once with rich arrays of academic programming, research, publications, performances, and social events that profoundly enrich life on our campuses. Foundations such as Mellon accelerated this trend by funding academic coordinators to facilitate collection-based research, classes at the museum, and general student and faculty outreach. Other university museums pursued such measures on their own, especially after the recession of 2008, when museums needed to demonstrate their academic worth to preserve the resources necessary to carry on. One of the brilliant advancements we have seen since the time of my survey is the broadening of how we interpret the mission of our college and university museums. From what was once a tight adherence to collection-based programming that has broadened to, a more has broadened to a more inclusive embrace of culture, societal inquiry, and concern for the sustainability of our planet. 
We have learned to leverage our collections through our expanding interpretations of mission in a kind of Doppler effect radiating out in concentric circles of relevance ever more broadly across campus and beyond, touching so many more people than just a few years ago. Allow me to share with you just a few sample, a small sampling of topics from a recent meeting of the Association of Academic Museums and Galleries. Here's just a list of what we talked about. Engaging students with issues of social justice, enriching STEM education with art, exploring science's impact on culture, addressing HIV AIDS, stereotypes, and censorship, using collections to teach analysis, hypothesis, testing of evidence, and other discipline-based skills, storytelling across continents, engaging Spanish-speaking communities, sharing stories of refugees, and addressing the challenges of immigration, climate change, controversial monuments, preserving plants, genocide, transnational collaboration, cultural property and the issues of repatriation, providing safe space for open discourse on race and ethnicity, gender and identity, and other sensitive conversations, sharpening the observational skills of medical students through exercises looking at art, providing a welcoming home for international students, and even operating museums without walls. Our museums have become far more valuable than any access to philanthropy than we may facilitate. Let me just point out one illogically undervalued asset that makes our university museums especially effective. Uh, it is we, the museum professionals, who activate our collections for scholarly, cultural, and scientific uses for which they were intended. We provide the cross-departmental, cross-disciplinary, and cross-cultural exchange of ideas that provosts and deans have been clamoring about for academic generations. We do this all the time in a central location and a neutral space. We are superb collaboratives, collaborators and highly entrepreneurial, mostly because we have to be to stretch our limited resources. Most important of all, we provide the passion, the expertise, the creativity and the professional ethics that energize our museums, establish their relevance to life on campus, and elevate them to irreplaceable public embodiments of the values represented by our colleges and universities at large. This is not auxiliary work. In the future, provosts, presidents, and university trustees will reverse the longstanding bias that an essay in a catalog somehow counts less than an article in a book, and qualified museum professionals will get academic status. Some do, most don't. In the future, I predict they will. Now before seating your attention, I've got two more ideas, each about collections. The first may seem a heresy, and that is that collections may unnecessarily narrow the service that a university museum provides. It is sometimes we, being object-trained museum professionals who constrain our programming with narrowly defined object-based necessity that I would argue need not apply to our institutions. We are different than private or municipal museums whose raison d'etre usually derives exclusively from their collections. At my small museum in Washington, D.C., we, we consider an empty room to be underperforming mission even if we must fill it with programs that do not relate to our collections, especially if the program be faculty or student driven and touch upon in some broad manner a concept of culture. For other museums, that may mean science or nature or history or another far reaching term that transcends the need to attach that discourse to a collection object, a gallery display or a traveling exhibition. NGOs, embassies, and other institutions are welcome to program in our space at no charge as well. I would license any university museum to unshackle itself from its collection so that it may exude the energy, enthusiasm, and interests of its academic institution as broadly and inclusively as possible. In my judgment, that would be operating on mission, 
even without a single object on display. For my second idea, I'd like to end with an orthodoxy. At their best, most relevant, and most utilized, our collections are centrally important. In an era when so many institutions of higher learning are casting their nets into the World Wide Web to conduct their business online, our university museums offer hands-on learning opportunities that cannot be replicated in the ether. There is no substitute for looking at the real object, be it a painting or sculpture or photograph or document or specimen or fossil. Observing details, holding the object in our beloved hands, uh, 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 even understanding the vast chasm of time between our human lives and the relics of eras long past. These are wondrous experiences, inaccessible in the online classroom and the ever popular MOOC. Authenticity is more than just wonder and awe. There are genuine skills of observation that, that are teachable through collection objects, such as the perception of nuance, sensitivity to detail, reflection and refraction of light, condition and the eroding effects of time, and so much more. Those people who once long ago taught us how to look, our mentors here at Dartmouth, opened our eyes to subtleties that expanded our worlds. Allow me to suggest that scholarship matters too. We university museums serve academic institutions that despite whatever pre-professional priorities may be invoked today, will always prioritize teaching and learning and research and publication, be it online, in video, or in printed, illustrated, annotated scholarly catalogs. The very stuff of tenure reviews and faculty promotions. Our collections will always form a nucleus of engagement around which circulate ideas that, sp that, that span humanity's knowledge and aspirations. Our galleries and examination rooms offer laboratories for discovery that to those students, faculty, and alumni, and even lay visitors who come to experience them can profoundly contribute to the richness of their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I'm so excited to be here. This is fantastic. So next up is Juliette Bianco, 94. She's deputy director, as you all know, of the Hood Museum and oversees the day-to-day -day operations. No small feat in light of the expansion, of course, indeed. She served as the Hood's primary representative for the museum's $50 million renovation, million dollar renovation expansion. I think she should get her own applause. Juliet holds a master's degree in art history from the University of Chicago and is a graduate of the Getty Leadership Institute's residence program. Um, and she is currently getting her doctorate in education from Northeastern University. Juliet. Thank you. Presenting the opportunity for students to engage with objects in close looking description and analytical refinement has long been a core function of college and university museums. In the mid 19th century, Robert Jameson, keeper of the Natural History Museum at Edinburgh College and professor of Charles Darwin, advocated for the preservation of the college's collections, quote, Another feature of my mode of teaching is that in the museum, where I meet the students three times a week and occasionally six days a week, I require them to describe fully those objects and afterward examine the descriptions and correct them. We in this auditorium know that this unique form of experiential learning has an important, even immutable, value for faculty and students fortunate enough to have a museum on campus. Empirical research backs this up, concluding that museum engagement improves learning outcomes in the arts, sciences, humanities, and social sciences, and elevates critical thinking, the development of empathy, comfort with ambiguity, and creativity. The Campus Museum does these things in the name of supporting the college's or university's purpose, often to great acclaim. 
Yet complacency is not a luxury we can afford. There are cautionary tales, such as the near closure of the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis in 2009, when the then president stated, quote, choosing between and among important and valued university assets is terrible, but our priority in the face of hard choices will always be the university's core teaching and research mission, end quote. These events compel us to consider that sustaining our relevance might well include participating in designing and developing our host institution's core missions. The mission or vision statement of many colleges and universities in the 21st century includes the stated or implied educational purpose of preparing students to participate in a socially, economically, and culturally globalized world. Looking at the mission statements of the institutions represented by members of this panel, for example, communicate what they intend to contribute. Mount Holyoke prepares students for thoughtful, effective, and purposeful engagement in the world. George Washington University has the Elliott School of International Affairs. Smith develops engaged global citizens and leaders to address society's challenges. And the University of Tennessee strives to enrich and elevate the citizens of the state of Tennessee, the nation, and the world. Our museum missions, the, the statements of our museums, interestingly, describe how we prepare these future leaders without actually mentioning that. The Smith College Museum of Art cultivates inquiry and reflection. The Hood seeks to advance critical thinking. And Mount Holyoke Museum aims to spark intellectual curiosity. The McClung Museum also comes right out and says, and I think this is terrific, the museum also participates in implementing the university central mission, and then goes on to describe exactly how they do that. So supporting the college at the mission level is already within our wheelhouse. Can we then imagine the campus museum of the future as participant in the college and universities developing understanding of its mission and identity in addition to supporter of that mission at the curricular and programmatic levels? The way forward in this regard is collaborative leadership. There are a couple real but sometimes overlooked roadblocks to museum participation at the institutional level and these may be part of the root cause for the events that happened at Brandeis. American college and universities were famously described in 1976 by organizational theorist Carl Wake as loosely coupled systems of decentralized units. Helpful to the preservation of the entire organization is that the activities of or changes within one unit or department uh, or division do not necessarily influence activities or changes in the others. On the other hand, this diffuse system, coupled with the tradition of shared governance, the structures and processes that balance legal and academic authority among trustees, administrators, and faculty, means that coordination among the units towards shared goals, particularly broad and ambiguous goals such as global leadership, can be a real challenge. Because campus museums often have no place within the traditional college or university governance system, they sit outside even what are dubbed the suburbs of that structure, which are occupied by the research centers and institutes that are increasingly be being given a seat at the decision-making table. Therefore, campus museums' most enticing avenues for contributing is to look to university advancement that is inherently collaborative. I'm not talking here in this talk about consulting on topics or activities that within the museum's control to realize, such as exhibitions, acquisitions, or programs, um, although we, we know the incredible value of this. Investing in deep and sustained interdisciplinary, informal, and formal collaboration can help museums not only stay relevant to, but also participate in shaping the articulation of the entire institution's purpose. I'm gonna give you a few examples. One direction for campus museums to explore creative change is through interdisciplinary collaboration and particularly at Dartmouth with indigenous communities. Some campus museums like the Hood already lead as partners in working to recognize and enforce the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA of 1990, but this practice could be further developed into mutually beneficial partnerships to lead ethical change for the entire museum field. 
The Hood Museum and Dartmouth College Libraries, in partnership with Native American Studies, has designed, but not yet started implementing, just such a collaboration. The project's aim is to bring, to build a, forefr a, a foreground, a, a framework, sorry, for cross-institutional collaboration and partnership, bringing together students, faculty, and museums, and library staff to develop culturally relevant practice. This includes developing a shared personnel and governance structure, creating innovative teaching and learning practices, and developing linked technological and digital asset management infrastructures. It intends to inform and influence faculty, individuals from Native American, Arctic, and indigenous communities, and library and museum professionals to develop best practices in relation to collections, technological infrastructures, and pedagogy that intentionally place culturally relevant materials at the forefront. When the museum engages in this kind of collaboration, in this case, and helpfully with the library, which is more formally connected to the institutional governance, its core mission of teaching with objects remains steady, but the intention is refocused on institutional advancement through collaboration. Seeking more of these opportunities over time can knit the museum more deeply into institutional activity. In addition to engaging in more formal and prolonged cross-disciplinary cl collaborations, campus museum leaders can also engage informally with campus colleagues to think about influencing higher education more broadly. Art museum administrators tend to present at professional conferences and publish their practice primarily within museum and discipline-specific fields. But the strategies we develop to effectively communicate with our students, faculty, and community members can be applied elsewhere, and increased presenting and publishing across general education platforms could bring the value of museum practice into the broader conversation. Some insightful studies I've read about learning in campus museums and art centers were written by faculty members or co-written by museum professionals and faculty members and published in Hispania, International Journal of Learning, CBE Life Sciences Education, and Teaching German. As a per personal example, when I published a case study a few years ago titled Go With the Flow, Fluxus at Play in a Teaching Museum, based entirely on interviews with faculty and students in art history, studio art, film and media studies, theater, and computer science, it was regrettably not positioned to promote object-based discourse within the higher education community, but for museum practitioners publication. While continuing to stay connected to the museum field, campus museum leaders could engage informally at higher education conferences, such as the American Council on Education or Association of American Colleges and Universities, in such informal publications as Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle of Higher Education, in peer-reviewed journals, and bridging what has be been perceived as a professional, even leadership divide. Teaching with objects, again, remains at the core, but the intention would be to share new ideas for developing and delivering experiential learning within higher education writ large. Finally, campus museums can seek to participate on decision or recommendation making teams for the college or university itself, truly participating in collaborative leadership. These opportunities could include a president, provost, or deem appointed committee, a search committee for a new administrator or faculty member, or a study group on a topic that affects institutional identity. I've personally experienced these teams serving on two committees for President Jim Wright for developing Dartmouth's 2002 strategic plan and hiring the Dean of Admissions, a Dean appointed Art and Innovation Working Group in 2017, and the provost appointed Javi Mural Study Group in 2018. Each gave me the opportunity to get closer to the action and experience a relationship building that often feeds into other formal and informal collaborations. And this is no accident. Building social and academic relationships and trust presents a proven framework around which to understand and make sense of leadership in higher education. Participating in collaborative leadership intertwines a museum with other areas of the college in a way that is appropriate to its loose couple, coupling hopefully blurring long-held institutional structures and bridging the governance divide in service to the advancement of institutional goals. Campus museums have long been valued for providing deep, content-rich support to academic disciplines. While our museums are loosely connected components within higher education, they are not considered critical to institutional decision-making. 
Participation in collaborative leadership with campus administrators, faculty, staff, and students offers many potential avenues for campus museums to answer to not just what, but what else. If campus museums store stand for the core value of teaching and learning with objects born of diverse cultures, perspectives, and creative impulses, and our institutional missions are about advancing leaders in a global society, the museum staff members can and should be natural partners for decision making on institutionally impacting issues. Museum professionals with their diverse roles and backgrounds in strategic and financial leadership and management, education, scholarship, programming, publishing, marketing, and development can contribute to campus leadership. The possibility offers exciting opportunities for both higher education and campus museums to change together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliet. That was wonderful. So next, um, I'm thrilled to welcome Catherine Robert Steinberg, 05, one of those special uh, aughts. Uh, she is the Assistant Director and Curator of Arts and Culture Collections at the McClung Museum of Natural History and Culture at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She oversees the museum's exhibition program and communication efforts and curates an eclectic 27,000 object collection of American and European fine and decorative arts, as well as material culture from around the world. Kat has her Master's of Science in Material Anthropology and Museum Ethno Ethnography from the University of Oxford. And I want to give a shout out. She worked as a student intern at the Hood and then returned also to the Hood after graduate school. So Kat Steinberg. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I really am so honored and flattered to be here today among so many greats. Um, and um, I'm just really excited to hear, learn more. So um, just as a side note, I would like to talk more about my Dartmouth experience specifically, but I think we're going to save that for the Q&A. So just, just know that, that I will speak a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but I, I did indeed begin my museum career here um, at the Hood Museum and have worked various places, but this is my home institution, the McClung Museum of Natural History and Culture at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, it's a really eclectic museum. We're, we sort of still function as a cabinet of curiosities in a lot of ways because we are a relatively new museum. So we have scientific collections alongside um, art collections, which is quite odd. And if any of you would like to work with me this weekend to tell me some creative thinking ways that you have about how I should balance all of that together, I would love to hear your ideas. Um, so this is where we're located. You can see in red Knox County, that's where Knoxville is located in East Tennessee. We're the flagship university for the state of Tennessee, and we're also a land grant university with a mission of bringing an affordable education to anyone that pursues it. We're also famous for our proximity to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, as well as for SEC football. You may be wondering why I tell you all these things, and it's really because I want to set the stage for what our community looks like and what our student population looks like. Um, so in Knoxville, slightly over one in four people live at or below the poverty line, and that's very similar to um, central eastern Kentucky where I grew up, and you can see that on the CDC map right here. Um, and so while our students don't have that um, rate of poverty, um, I will just say that it's not a normal experience for our average student to be going to museums all the time. Um, that is not something that a lot of students are familiar with. And indeed, even though I was came from a privileged background, um, there are not of a lot of museums in rural areas of the country. And so coming to museums is not necessarily a part of regular um, practice um, in a lot of schools in the area, nor a part of everyday life. Um, so in this sense, Knoxville really is an important hub for arts and culture in the region. For many of our university students that visit the museum for classes in our object study room, or in our galleries, um, or the many students who intern and volunteer or collaborate with us on programming, it's the first time that they've been in a museum. So in this sense, what does authentically engaging community look like in that type of a space? 
How do we sustain our collaborations? And who will use the academic mu museum of the future? And how might we change that? Um, I do want to say I'm coming from a curatorial perspective today, but um, I will be talking a lot about traveling exhibitions. I do work on my own exhibitions. I do work on our permanent collections um, very frequently. But I'm specifically bringing up these exhibitions today because we bring in um, traveling exhibitions to cover content areas that we can't with our own collections. Um, and I specifically also want to focus on the ways in which programming and outreach is really a transformative experience when it comes to curatorial work um, in a museum. Because to, kudos to all those museum educators out there. Without museum educators and without collaborative programming, my exhibitions would simply be dead things on a wall, you know? So I, I just really want to point that out. So from the beginning of my time at the McClung, um, I, I knew that I wanted to do curatorial work that was um, looking at the issues that were effect that was affecting um, our local community. And growing up in the region, um, I knew that we were a hot spot for the opioid epidemic. In fact, a lot of my high school classmates um, died of opioid overdose. Um, and that was back in 2001. So um, in Knoxville, is something that's felt deeply. You can see, again, some CDC maps um, looking at statistics mapped onto the state in Knoxville. Is is, um, has one of the highest overdose rates in the state. Um, and indeed, Tennessee has some of the highest overdose rates in the nation. So I read about an online exhibition um, on the history of drug use that was curated by Dr. Manuel Perry of um, the University of Amsterdam for the US National Library of Medicine. And I thought it would be a really great opportunity to engage with that issue on our campus. So I took Manuel's exhibit with her permission, and I um, doubled the number of objects and expanded upon some of the ideas using our permanent collections. So you'll see um, on the left um, a 16th century depiction of an opium poppy from our collections by the French artist Jacques Lemoyne de Morgue, but also a naloxone injector um, on the right, which of course is the medicine that's used by healthcare professionals to revive people that have overdosed on opiates. The timing was strategic for a lot of reasons. Um, one of those was that the university had named opi opioid research as a major initiative at the time, a goal that continues currently. Um, and because we have so many people that work on these topics at University of Tennessee, it was really easy to put together relevant programming. Um, also, as you might imagine, if you work in the humanities or social sciences, talking about drug use in your coursework is really easy to do. There's so many different ways that you can talk about the, the history of the use of drugs. Um, and you know, so it was easy to get professors from sociology and anthropology, art, philosophy into the exhibition space. But there were also some unexpected collaborations that came out of it. And what you're seeing here is um, a doctor from um, UT Medical School. Um, and she was talking, she helped host a town hall style talk um, on the history of pain and addiction in East Tennessee. Um, and she helped us engage with the local Metro Drug Coalition as well as city officials on this issue. We were also able to work with nursing students in conversations about the history of opioid use in America and how cultural stereotypes have driven treatment and health of addiction over time. And the success of those conversations helped the museum develop ongoing partnerships with a nursing school in which we work with students to own their observational and communication abilities about art, which of course translate to the same skills involved in diagnosis and other aspects of patient care. And so it makes sense that when you're working with professors and perhaps even with student groups that your collaborations are often time bound. It's okay that they're a one off, that's the expectation. But when you're working with community groups, what is the value add for a community um, to spend a lot of time working with you and then you drop them after an exhibition? And so I think that this is something that a lot of museums, um, especially those working with indigenous groups are really having to come to grips with right now. I know my own museum is. Um, and that's why I wanna talk about this particular exhibition as well. Well, we recently hosted the um, NEH on the Road exhibition for all the world to see, visual culture and the struggle for civil rights. Um, and part of the goal of that show was for local venues to um, engage with um, local people in your community to talk about the civil rights movement um, and how, how it happened on a small scale um, in, in, in cities and towns around the US. And so here you see two members of our education team um, with um, Joe Valentine, who is a community organizer in Knoxville. Ms. Valentine's really amazing, and she helped us um, organize a roundtable discussion about the civil rights movement. 
Um, and in some ways, it was a really healing moment um, for our community. So it included older members of the civil rights movement from the 50s and 60s, as well as um, professors who teach on the issue, as well as current members um, of the NAACP. And for the older participants, um, it was the first time that they'd been on campus in a long time for a lot of them. A lot of them had really negative feelings um, towards University of Tennessee and how they would dealt with desegregation. And many had never been asked by anyone to talk about the things that they had done locally to move the movement forward in Knoxville. Um, these are some images from just a few weeks ago and ongoing collaborations that we have with Ms. Valentine um, and some members of the community, in including her church. Um, she was so inspired by the exhibition that she actually took the themes from the exhibition and created um, her own mini exhibitions, which you'll see right here on this table, using the themes of the show to talk about her own experiences and for her own church members to talk about their experiences with the civil rights movement. They had these up in their church, but for them, and I know from Miss Valentine's actually interviewed her, she said that to be able to have this in a museum space was incredibly legitimizing of her own experiences. Um, and what that taught me is that it's not always important for museums to be content creators. And this is something I've learned actually over and over again, but this is just the most recent example of that. Um, sometimes we need to simply be the venue for other people to tell their own stories. So how can curatorial work shape and change who's engaged in our museums? This is my last example here. Um, we recently organized an exhibition on indigenous um, art, contemporary indigenous art from India. And as part of that, we had an India festival with a local um, South Asian and, and Indian community. Um, Dr. Bhavna Vora, who's a local physician on the left, she helped sponsor that. And she was so enthused at the 800 people that showed up for the festival that she became really engaged with the museum and continued to come to our lectures, our programming. Um, we saw a lot of her. Um, and because she was bringing so many members of her own community and her family to all these events, we said, how about you serve on our board? And she enthusiastically agreed. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that um, we'll be creating museum leadership that better reflects the diversity of our broader community by virtue of doing this type of outreach. So I'm not going to tell you about that because I don't have time. Um, <laughs> exhibitions are really a catalyst for change. I do believe that. Um, and I especially have a message for students and museum supporters today, and that's that I think sometimes when you go to an institution like Dartmouth um, and when you work in the museum world, the message that you can get is that your work only matters if you do it at several of the top institutions in the world. That work is incredibly important, and I love hearing about the work that you all are doing at those top institutions this weekend, so I don't want to discount it in any way at all. Um, or that, you know, as a curator, the exhibitions that matter are those that sort of tread over the same territory in terms of Euro-American artists that we all know, or perhaps, you know, um, new contemporary artists who are making the rounds in New York City. That's also important, too, so I don't want to discount that either. But I just wanted to say that the ability to localize at the museum level is a strength. And your stories and the stories of your community, no matter how big or small, they matter. You change the world when you illuminate and hold up the stories of the people that you live with. And academic museums, I think, are uniquely situated to do this very thing. I don't know if you all know this cartoon from The New Yorker, 1976. Um, this was definitely my experience of geography at Dartmouth. Um, when I told people I was from Kentucky, they were like, I have no idea where that is. New York sort of jams up against the West Coast, and maybe Chicago and DC are somewhere really, really vague in between. Um, and so I'm, I'm here to tell you again, especially to students, that there's really important work to be done all over the nation, in small communities and in big ones, and that you have the potential to change your community in a really deep way when you choose to work in small museums and museums outside city centers. Um, this is also where a lot of museum jobs that you can get are. So especially <laughs> as um, emerging museum professionals, I encourage you to do this important work um, in these communities. And I look forward to seeing the, um, the work that the next generation of young museum professionals does. So thank you for having me.
Thank you so much, Kat. Yeah, we had that conversation because, uh, quick aside, I if someone told me when I was 25 living in New York that I would move to St. Louis, Indianapolis, and then South Hadley in a period of nine years, I would have looked at them and said they were bonkers. So Kat and I were talking about explore and take, let fate uh, be your guide. So last but not least, we have Maggie Lynn Newey, O2, another one of the aughts. She is Associate Director of Academic Programs and Public Education at the Smith College Museum of Art, where she works to make the museum an accessible interdisciplinary resource for the college's campus and broader communities. And I'm nearby to her, so I can say that I have been very impressed by the work she's doing. Maggie completed her Master's of Arts in Teaching in Museum Education from George Washington University and a Master's in Art History from the Courtauld Institute of Art. She also worked as a Hood intern and then returned also after she graduated from college, also grad, after grad school or after, yeah, after grad school. So welcome Maggie Newey. Okay. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here this weekend. I'm so excited. I always love talking about academic museums. And special thanks to Sharon and Stephanie for their organizational skills in getting us all here. Um, and everyone from the caterers to our IT specialists for making this event possible. It's really wonderful to get connected with so many um, Dartmouth Museum people and museum lovers. So for my first 10 minutes, this, or for my 10 minutes this morning, I wanted to focus on uh, the unique opportunity that I think academic museums have to push the broader museum field forward. And I think that the impetus to lead this change comes from our key target audience, um, college students. And um, on our campuses, I think we have the opportunity to offer up our institutions, not just our collections, um, as subjects for critical inquiry. I think academic museums are positioned to support college students as instigators for change within museum practice and to provide a foundation for them to take that advocacy and activism out into the field. So here's some perspective on where I'm coming from. Um, I work at the Smith College Museum of Art, which is located in Northampton, Massachusetts, just two hours south down uh, the Connecticut River. Smith College's mission is that it educates women of promise for lives of distinction and purpose. So we have 2,400 undergraduates who all um, self-identify as women upon admission. Um, some statistics related to our student engagement I've included up here. Um, in, in this last year, we had counted 6,600 um, college student visits. That included 186 uh, college classes using the museum and 118 students working or volunteering behind the scenes. Um, and we also at the museum, this is something I'll talk a bit more about today, we host something that we call the Museum's Concentration, which is an academic program in museum studies for undergraduates, which is kind of a unique thing. Um, so more to come on that. But in terms of the unique opportunities and motivators for change within academic museums, I just wanted to share this quote uh, from the New York Times from a couple years ago for a little context. Um, I'll just read it. Campuses that have prided themselves on increased diversity in admissions are now wrestling with students who want more control over the institutions they attend. So our students at Smith and across higher education are increasingly diverse. And they are rightfully demanding more of their colleges and universities. This includes advocating for change within areas including hiring of staff and faculty, housing, uh, the curriculum itself, and I would say also their campus museums. Um, this photograph you see here shows a glimpse from a Smith College protest from last spring that was convened to communicate uh, some student concerns over the political leanings of a new police chief that was hired. So students are really eager for structural and systemic change within institutions. Um, and obviously this, this atmosphere, charged atmosphere is not unique to colleges and universities right now. The public is also demanding more of all public institutions, um, including cultural organizations uh, through movements like decolonize this place, for example. Um, but in academic museums, I think this, this energy amongst our students is something to really build on and embrace and certainly while grounding it, I think, in historical frameworks and thoughtful analysis. And I think, I think that's where we come in. Um, so just what does it look like to be intentional about this? I think within higher education, the museum itself 
can be opened up as a subject for, for analysis, um, critique, interrogation, questioning, and dialogue. Um, and I think that with this foundation, as students head out into the world, um, whether or not they end up working museums, they have the, hopefully will be provided with a foundation in critical museum literacy that will support them in holding the entire field accountable. And so at Smith, uh, we are doing this in one way through our museum's concentration, which again is a museum studies course that's a uh, program that's hosted and directed by our museum. And it's an interdisciplinary museum studies program that invites students to consider all types of museums as subjects for study and critique. And so here's just a description of our program. And some of the key components um, include an intro um, class that's open to any students on campus, um, and then a senior uh, capstone seminar that's just for the students who are accepted into the specific program. Um, and in between those two, kind of that start and end of the, uh, the bookends of the program, they take four electives from across the curriculum and complete two practical, practical experiences based in museums. Um, and I actually am lucky enough to get to direct that intro course. Uh, we call it our gateway course. And I'll just read you the descriptions, this description of the class here. Museums are multi-layered institutions with complex histories. Their role in society reflects contemporary perspectives on the ways knowledge is produced, categorized, and communicated. This half-semester course introduces students to key topics reflecting the history of collecting institutions, their evolving public mission, and critical issues central to their work today. And so you can see here just a list of some of the selected topics. Um, each week in this course, there's an invited speaker who presents on a different topic. There are scholars and museum professionals who join us. So over the past couple years, we've had topics like uh, Wunderkammer as museum history and contemporary practice, colonialism and revolution, museums collecting the world. Um, I'll skip ahead to the second to last year, museums and the production of knowledge, incorporating indigenous knowledges in curatorial practice. Actually, we were joined this semester by Jamie Powell, um, who presented that topic for us. Uh, your, your own Jamie Powell here at the Hood. Um, so the class typically has around 40 students from across all majors and all class years. And for many, it's their first time thinking about what happens behind the scenes in a museum. Um, and each week, each week I ask students in this large class to share a question or a comment on an index card as a way of kind of keeping track of what they're thinking about, what's catching their attention. And I just wanted to share some of the really incisive and probing questions that these students ask. And again, remember, these are students who have never, most of them have never thought beyond the surface of what they experience in a museum. So here's, is there a museum in the world without any stolen objects? <laughs> How do museums determine what is valuable and what is not? How much of a connection is there between the rise of capitalism and the rise of museums? How do museums change their meanings when they change their spaces? What are ways to center conversations onto who is creating exhibitions narratives, to endow communities of historically and ongoing oppressed identities, the tools and resources to create their own revolutionary spaces using their own experience, knowledge, and power? So, you know, wow. <laughs> they're, they're, they're bringing really fresh perspectives and fresh eyes to the work of cultural institutions. And I think it's exciting to think about how we, as academic muse museums, can support them in following these threads and finding answers as part of their academic um, careers. And so, just to show you, out of the students who participate in that entry course, about 15 per class year are selected to participate in the more in-depth full program. And so by their senior year, um, they're all creating independent projects as a culmination of their work. I just wanted to show you some a few examples of where those early questions then lead them at that stage. Um, so you can see here at the top, Isabel, top left, Isabel thought about what she framed as difficult objects within our own collection at Smith. Um, these were indigenous cultural materials that had been transferred from the Science Center years ago. So she worked to trace some, some of the undocumented histories of those objects and to define future questions for study. Um, Adela, at the top right, thought about the role of archival materials within museums and museum display. And um, she kind of thought that through as an aspect of thinking about how can museums be more transparent about their histories. 
Um, at the bottom right, Maya worked on a more practical project. Um, she pilot, piloted an, uh, a, and worked with some open source technology to design some augmented reality experiences that engaged with works in our collection. And finally, Natalie, who is very interested in museum education, um, piloted an interactive digital tour that provided multiple layers um, addressing both family and adult audience needs. So all these projects um, in this, in, for these, that these seniors create are really forward thinking and I think they push us as museum staff to think about real applications for our institution. And so outside of the museum's concentration, um, the museum has also supported this kind of critical thinking in extracurricular context. So in fall 2008, we invited applications from student organizations to co-present a program with us. We just sort of put the call out. Um, and the strongest applicant for that, for that grant was um, a group called the Indigenous Smith Students and Allies. And in November 2018, we presented the, a program with them um, that they called Exposing Colonialism and Embodying Sovereignty. And they really wanted to present this as a real critical look at museums with us. Um, and it included, you can see on the left, a keynote address by a woman named Jamie Arsenault, who they invited. She's a tribal historic preservation officer who works with museums to repatriate objects to their communities. And then it was followed by a walking tour in the museum that students positioned themselves in front of specific works of art and provided their own personal responses to things in the gallery. So it was a really strong, impactful program. Um, and it led to, to a small but concrete example, I think, of institutional change that I wanna share with you. And it was actually change that's focused on this painting that you see uh, one of the students responding to here. So I'm gonna zoom in on that. This is a painting in our collection uh, by an artist named Francis Seth Frost called South Pass, Wind River Mountains, Wyoming. It dates to 1860. And it's an image of a Wyoming landscape and it includes, it's hard to see, but it includes a caravan of settlers on horseback crossing the valley. And I'm gonna zoom in here. There's a group of indigenous, um, indigenous figures on this rocky outcropping. Um, this work had traditionally been interpreted in our gallery text through sort of the lens of a very art historical narrative um, as a key example of an East Coast artist creating dramatic imagery of the Western American landscape. Um, and the student who responded to this work, she rightfully critiqued the label for the lack of attention paid to the indigenous narrative. Um, we took this as an opportunity for our student to learn from, from her. And I'll just quickly show you, I hope you can see here, um, I need to wrap up in a minute, but that we made a change to the label, a crucial change, which is the way we were describing this place. Um, the, the old label described it as a passage through the Rocky Mountains that had served as an important milestone for Oregon-bound immigrants. Um, and the new label talks about how it represents, uh, the artist represents an indigenous group, indigenous group looking down on the broad expanse of open land known today as South Pass, Wyoming, homelands of the Eastern Shoshone people. The Eastern Shoshone language refers to this pass as Mudza, literally mountain sheep. Mudza South Pass was the most accessible route across the Rocky Mountains and has been used for millennia as a corridor for transportation and trade. Thousands of white settlers like those shown here moving across the flat basin traveled through this region on their way to California. So important, you know, small change within the museum, but important. Um, and so just to take a quick step back to where I started, how can museums, academic museums make an impact on the broader field? A key opportunity and responsibility that's represented by all of us here today is that we are training future museum leaders and cultural workers. Um, so while not all students in the museum's concentration go on to work in museums, many do. I just, you can take a look here at a few examples of, of folks, students who are doing good work out in the field from Smith. Um, and finally, one of our flashier alums is a woman named Kimberly, Kimberly Drew, who graduated from the museum's concentration in 2012. And she's already gone on to create a really influential career in museums and media, including several years as the social media manager for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Last spring, she was a keynote speaker at the American Alliance of Museums National Conference. And in her talk, there was this really powerful moment where she shared 
um, her outgoing salary at the Met, which is the top number, and she called attention to the discrepancy between that number and the outgoing salary of her predecessor, who happened to be a white man. And this candid moment um, has led to a broader push within the field for salary transparency. So there's now a circulating Google spreadsheet where museum professionals from around the country are sharing their salaries with each other um, that's continuing to grow. And so just wanted to share that example. We can't take credit for Kim's career. Um, but I would like to think that we at, at Smith were able to nurture an environment for critical examination of museums that I think provided a foundation for the work that she's on, gone on to do. So. Just to conclude, I, again, I think academic museums have a unique opportunity to position museums as a topic for study, to build a foundation for informed cultural critique, and to really shape the museum of the profession, or shape the future of the profession. Thank you. There. Thank you so much, Maggie. That was fantastic. So let me get settled here. All right. Round of applause for everybody. So I'm going to start a new campaign to rebrand it. The Dartmouth Art Mafia. It has a nice ring. Dart Art. So we're going to start doing that. I think all of us should now be posting that on our social media platforms. Um, so connecting to Dartmouth, and since we are the panel of academic museums, we thought we would take a little uh, trip back memory lane, down memory lane. Um, and so I thought all of us, um, for each of you to share a bit about your Dartmouth experiences and if Dartmouth inspired or encouraged you on your path into the art world, and then also briefly share how you landed at each of your academic museums. Yes, I mean, Dartmouth was, a, is, was really foundational for me. I started my work at the Hood um, as a security guard, actually, which was a great experience. I, being in museums for me, I felt like home, so it was kind of nice to have my work study position um, in my first year be in the museum. And then I also went on to be a gift shop attendant. Um, and then finally, having a, a senior internship just gave me a sense of what, uh, that this was a place, type of place and the type of people that I wanted to be working with in my career. Um, and so I always was kind of looking out for an opportunity to come back into an academic museum, um, just because I think they are really unique um, institutions, uh, you know, we're surrounded by people who are already eager to learn and think big ideas, and so there's some, there's sort of an energy in academic museums that's a little bit, a little bit different and special, I think. I definitely was very influenced by Dartmouth um, to go on and pursue my career in museums. I see a lot of the people I love and who shaped that on the audience today. Um, Professor Coffey and Professor Kenseth. I don't know if Alan Hockley is here. Um, and all the Hood Museum staff, including Bonnie, who I worked with multiple times. Um, I um, use the D plan liberally. I worked at the um, American Museum of Natural History my sophomore year. I was an intern my senior year. Um, I traveled to Morocco and to um, the Brazilian Amazon and to multiple other places um, to work with um, indigenous communities, learning more about them. Um, and then they also funded my graduate work. <laughs> so that was really important too, because it's, it's hard on museum salaries, which I think we need to acknowledge, um, to often fund the, um, your education in order to go on and do this kind of work. Um, so it was just absolutely imperative. I, I had no idea I wanted to work in museums, and it was the um, faculty here that really made me realize that that was something that I was interested in. I'll, I'll agree, and, and uh, obviously I'm still here, so. 
Dartmouth and the Hood Museum had a big impact on my life. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I really have to say it was the opportunity to engage in experiential learning abroad with Professor Kenseth uh, that really made uh, an incredible mark on my understanding that uh, standing in front of and discourse around uh, a work of art that really mattered uh, to someone who made it and uh, to those who would behold it and live with it uh, was very, very important to me. And when I went, uh, when I left Dartmouth, went to graduate school at University of Chicago, I had two jobs in the Smart Museum of Art at the time. I worked in the education department and I worked in the registrar's department, uh, helping to create the first um, collections catalog on a, a, a spreadsheet. And uh, I really realized that, that that need to be with objects and to be with people uh, talking about objects and how they stay relevant to our lives was very important to me. Uh, so when I came back uh, to Dartmouth. It was easy to start contributing to the Hood Museum of Art and um, to never leave. <laughs> I, I gave you my commercial for Dartmouth at the beginning, but uh, I do have in my possession a folder with 50 three letters in it, which are the rejection letters I got until I got my first job in the museum field. Uh, I'd gotten my PhD from Stanford and is at the Smithsonian as a fellow, aren't I a big shot? I'm gonna be a professor somewhere, no I'm not. <laughs> the, the job market wasn't particularly open when I was looking around and, uh, uh, and those places that were open were not, per, uh, you know, you're wondering are you gonna go there? So at one point I, decide, I'm, where was it, Lisa yesterday talking about Wichita in the middle of the country? Yeah, uh, I was at the, uh, you were in the middle, I was at the end of the art world in Birmingham, Alabama for my job, uh, which is by the way a really good museum. It is a really good museum. And I was the curator of the collections and the like, with first job, and you know, that's, you didn't go from the Smithsonian to Birmingham, what happened to you? Well, I wound up working with an architect named Edward Larrabee Barnes, <laughs> and, and we built a new wing and I built a sculpture garden on the back and then got another job and, and that kind of thing, and, uh, and then got lucky because the trustees at my next job decided they would pay for my business school. <laughs> that, that, that helped. Anyway. I, I did go from the Smithsonian to working at a lesser known academic museum, and so, you know, again, you go where the jobs are and you go where you can make an impact, and I think that I would think that I could speak possibly for all of us on the panel to say that you can make a unique kind of impact at an academic museum, which is I think why all of us do what we do. Speaking of John's rejection, I'll share, I think I've shared with some of you, I got rejected from my application to the Hood internship my senior year. <laughs> also, it was, it was also much more competitive because there are only two. Uh, maybe Kathy was in that decision making, I don't know. <laughs> You know, I have not held it against you at all. I did think that I thought my career was over when I was 21 and for like, an, for like um, two minutes, I, I, no, maybe like a minute, you know, like five, five to maybe five minutes, I was thinking, oh, my fa I'm gonna be a failure. I'll never make it, never get, never get a job. Anyway, so um, I want to move on to um, questions um, for the panel and then we'll open up um, to uh, the audience and um, I think all of you remarked about, upon this in certain ways, but can you share um, with me um, the kind of liberties that you uh, have taken being at an academic museum uh, in comparison to a standalone museum? What are the freedoms? I can speak to that. I think, I think that when you work at a larger institution sometimes, um, even public institutions, you're kind of locked into your very box of a job, especially working in the government, <laughs> um, which can be good because they have a lot of resources, a lot of people to do those jobs. When you, when you work in academic museums, and especially at smaller museums too, you get to wear a lot of hats in a lot of ways that afford you a lot of freedoms to do whatever you want, which is why I could do the kinds of exhibitions that I did on drug use in America um, at my institution. And I think there's a lot of freedom in being able to collaborate with people too. Um, I think that the ideas that you get um, working with professors and students, um, in a lot of ways there's, there's fewer expectations about what types of exhibitions that you can put on, at least in my own institution. And so there's a lot of freedom in coming up with creative ways to engage um, with ideas that faculty and students have specifically because of that. 
I think one of the most wonderful things about being at an academic museum is that um, while we uh, sadly continue to get older, our primary audience is always 18 to 22 years old. <laughs> And so we have this wonderful opportunity to uh, stay really connected to what matters to um, those people who are going to be leading and changing our world. Uh, and that, that, I think, is something very special to our mission uh, that keeps me motivated. I've been a director of both kinds of museums. And what I've come to learn is that there is a skill set that is valuable at a university museum that you don't see as much at a municipal, and that is the skill of letting go of control. When you can let go of control, you can allow faculty and student participation, and I believe in some of these talks you saw, how enriching it can become, but you have to open up, and I, I run a museum now that is a merged museum, so the staff came from a private museum into a university setting, and they had to all learn the skill of controlling their exhibition less, in exchange for content that was far more than they could have imagined on their own. Yeah, and I, th I think um, the space for dialogue here at the Hood is a really great example of what happens when you put students at the center of, of a process within a museum and, and empower them to um, interpret collections through what's important to them. And, and so I think um, that's something where, that's a place where we get to be really creative and allow students to be really creative um, putting them at the front of what we do. Okay, since the heart of a lot of what we do uh, is drawn from the collection, I wanted to ask you, how has collecting and the acquisition process been different for you uh, in your selections, um, being at an academic museum versus a standalone museum? I'll jump right in on that. But I'm. As the head of education at my museum, I'm lucky enough to be on the acquisitions team, which I don't think is true at all um, standalone museums. And so my voice is valued as part of the process in terms of what will the teaching value be of objects that are being acquired? Um, how might it connect to subjects um, other than art history? Um, will it be something, can we, can we envision specific faculty members um, kind of mining these works for teaching? So, so that's one way I think that it's certainly different is that that's a, a priority in, in how collections are built. Yeah, I would say too that um, you, you have a little bit more freedom in what you collect. Um, our ed all of our educators, both academic programs and K-12, sit on our acquisitions team as well. And so obviously, um, sometimes, you know, a lot of academic museums acquire prints. They're affordable. You can pull them out readily. You can use them for almost any type of um, humanities course. So we do see a lot of that. But also, we get to use our weird objects. I mean, we could have a separate conversation about um, the need for deaccession at my museum and um, unchecked acquisition for many, many years, especially driven by um, the development team at the University of Tennessee. <laughs> if you give me this $5, you can give me all the stuff in your attic. Um, but, but some of those very, very weird objects are very, very interesting. So, you know, um, we have a woman who is traveling. Um, she had her PhD, and she was from East Tennessee, from a rural area, and she was traveling in the Middle East in the late 19th century. Um, it, and she was coming back with holy objects. And so, you know, her holy sack of lentils um, that she collected in Palestine and her sort of like little, it's like a museum. It's like a museum of the Holy Land with like little segments for each of these little holy substances that she collected places. That's a really, really interesting object to teach with. And so I think that's, that's one thing that I see. Yeah, I'm going to add to that. Um, I've always been at um, freestanding museums until I got to Mount Holyoke. And it's been so much harder to think about deaccessions because you really can come up with any reason to keep an object, and we have to be really, I have to learn how to be, hard, you know, tougher and more rigorous than our decision to make, you know, to make those, those deaccession decisions. I'll just mention, uh, for us, I think, inviting students to participate in um, the acquisitions themselves is one of the special things about being an academic museum. So we have a program uh, called uh, uh, Museum Collecting 101 that we've been running for many, many years. Uh, and Kenji Prepit Potman Cole, who's here and will be speaking later today, participated uh, not only as a student, uh, then as a student leader of that program, uh, and then as a student curator uh, of objects uh, uh, about critical issues rela related to changes in the environment, all as a Dartmouth student, 
uh, in uh, using those very objects that were chosen and collected by students. So in that way, and he's written about it in the Museum uh, Now book as well uh, as well, when he was an undergraduate. So I think the opportunity to think about um, your primary audience uh, as contributors to not only as receivers of the work that we do as uh, something very special about our museums. Wall Street Journal called up about a year ago or six months about an article I got a call on. They were interviewing people about why major donors were giving to universities as opposed to municipal uh, uh, institutions. And uh, what, what, what my feeling was was that, uh, well, a few things. One is that the municipal museums are uh, full up with a lot of works already in their galleries. But more important to university is that we can activate the storage collection is that we can bring people into storage and through faculty and student engagement, the collection is not dormant just to cherry pick the top of the collection that may be the case in a municipal museum, but in a university museum, the entirety of the work can be done. So it's our job not so much to worry about what's coming in and we should be slowing the intake, not speeding it up, but to activate those works and utilize them as, as fully as, and, and cr as creatively as possible. Yeah, I actually brought that. It's called Art Donors Increasingly Look to University Museums. So if you have not seen that, you should look. And a few other comments in regards to that is, is that it's so essential to donor engagement, right? And that a lot of times, um, in, even in my short time just as director of the Mount Holyoke College Art Museum, I found that the ways that um, we can engage with donors to increase their philanthropy and cultivate their work is first through a work of art that they give to the museum, and then over the time, they see the great impact of how it's uh, affecting the gallery spaces, but also in teaching moments, and then that eventually encourages them to give as well philanthropically to, to the museum. So all of you spoke so effectively about um, um, the history and development of the academic museum and the role of the academic museum with a parent institution and then what the curator does in embracing the local collection, a community, uh, and then of course the role of the student as uh, pushing us forward. So I think all of you have really gotten to the heart of, of what we had conversations before about how museum, uh, how academic museums can stay relevant uh, and what can ensure our future. But um, let's now kind of zone in deeper, and I'd love for you to share how in your particular roles do you feel that we should prioritize um, the work that we do to ensure our transformative capacity? So all of you already talked about that, but just kind of zone in on your top soundbite that what you think is crucial for the future of the academic museum and what you should prioritize in your role. Big question, <laughs> I think. Um, I think we need to keep working to diversify our collections. I think, as the Hood has done, I think we need to think about the ways that space is allocated and, and prioritized in our buildings. Um, I think we need to keep building relationships and partnerships across campus. Um, and really, whether we're, whether we're serving or part of the conversations or whether we're just um, paying close attention, we definitely need to align what we're doing with the strategic goals of our universities and colleges um, and just making sure that we're in step with um, those bigger goals. Yeah, I think that will definitely be crucial to my own institution. We recently moved from reporting to the chancellor to the provost, and so really aligning ourselves with student success on campus, what, whatever that means at University of Tennessee, is going to be really, really important for us. But I think that also we just have a lot of listening to do um, at our institution, and I would like to see us um, at our own institution. We have over 6,000 human remains um, that we're working on repatriating right now. Um, one of the largest... Um, NAGPRA collections at a, at a university. And I think that we need to move beyond NAGPRA. We don't, I mean, we need to move just beyond um, the law and following the law and actually engaging with those communities and thinking about repatriating objects that nece aren't necessarily subject to NAGPRA. And um, we need to be listening a lot more. We need to be inviting the communities that we want to come, that we want to engage with to come in and, and, um, and speak with us and not just, you know, send them text and have them rubber stamp it. I think it's really easy for us in the field to, um, and, and John, you, you touched on this as well, to be um, very isomorphic in um, the way we think about our institutions and in that we tend to resemble each other 
more uh, than we do um, those who we collaborate with. It's a, it's a comfortable professional place to be in. And, and so I think we really need to continue to push ourselves as museum professionals and leaders to think outside of um, those comfortable places where um, we kind of know what our role is and we know what we're doing uh, and to be thinking about more uh, blended professional roles and asking those questions if we really are truly collaborating or if we're staying within a place that's um, comfortable. And that's a really hard thing to do. Uh, and I think it's easy for museums um, because we have so many sort of rules in our collections and you, know, you can't touch this object and these sorts of things. Uh, it's easy to be collaborators when um, those things are met and it's harder to be collaborators uh, when um, those things are being challenged. And so I think you know, thinking about what the boundaries are and how you can break those boundaries down, um, it will be really important for the future if we want to see ourselves as true collaborators. I just saw my board chairman is here, Doug Evelyn from the Smithsonian has come to visit us and, and uh, I, I point him out because he's a Smithsonian longtime professional worked at the AAM and having a museum pro on your board, I don't know why any board would not have a museum for it. So, so, so remarkably helpful, but the, uh, 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 with, with the, 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 the question you, you ask is uh, the, the breadth of what we can gain from students and faculty. It's like a recurring source of energy. I'm now at the smallest museum I've ever directed, but it's the largest as well, because when you count the faculty and the students and that as your institution, it's, it's like an accordion that gets as, 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 as wide and as broad as you expand it. And so there's a wealth of opportunity, and as I've seen, in the old days, you started your career at a museum. Uh, at a university because it was the training ground to grow up and run a big museum later. I think it's turning around to the opposite right now. People are discovering the complexities and opportunities that are available in universities and they're extraordinarily large the further outward you look. So questions from the audience. Yes. Di is that Diana Vady? Yeah. Yes. Diana Vady. Yes, we met yesterday. John answered my question. Oh. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that, that's a really good question, and I think it's one, it's one of the things I'm sort of hinting at is that in general, uh, museums often say, we want to collaborate as long as you do X, Y, and Z, and as long as it's in these places, as long as these conditions are met. And so the, I think a question for all of us, I don't really have an answer, is, um, you know, what are the risks and what are the benefits? Um, and, and kind of really measuring those against each other uh, and thinking, again, what, what else can we do? Um, and uh, I think that's really uh, an opportunity uh, and a challenge for us. Uh, as academic museums, and we all have we all have these spaces, and we all want to make our collections more accessible. Can I just ask one, one question? Question on information. Yes, responding to Alan's question. Um, if you think that the And that, I think that's really uh, one of our goals too, particularly with the expanded museum uh, and thinking about the spaces we would create is um, how can, when students uh, spend four years at Dartmouth having a museum, how can they, uh, e whether they took a class or not, how can they um, go forward in their lives thinking of a museum as another place to be, another place to, to live their lives in, another space for that. Uh, and that can just take so many different forms. Um, and it's one of the things that excites me about uh, using our spaces uh, as we continue to, to see what it offers, the new building. Yes, and lower in the front. Yes, next to Joy. <laughs> 
again. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry I came in a little bit late. Um, just flew in yesterday. Um, but I, I wanted to, in the hopes that I have some, we have some of our students here this in the early morning sessions. I think we do, maybe a few. I wanted to talk, ask Kat a question because I remember when Kat was here, you were sort of straddling art history and anthropology, trying to sort of reconcile the very different paradigms around the object and what the object, how you how you illuminate an object, how you study it, um, what it means. Uh, and, and then, if I'm recalling correctly, you went to Goldsmiths, or no, you went to England, though, to do some work there. I went in to a, Oxford. Yeah. In a much more material, cultural kind of um, uh, training. And, uh, and I think one of our, one of the joys of working with you is that I was coming out of museum studies, and I was in cultural studies, and I was also sort of um, always a bit um, pushing against the boundaries of a very kind of formalist connoisseurship sort of approach to the object. So I was hoping to hear you and, and any, really anyone else on the panel who wants to talk about this, to talk a bit more about training and sort of how do, you know, sort of uh, how do different kinds of training inform the, the way you curate? Um, uh, and perhaps you address that, but we do, of course, this is a liberal arts institution and in its best sense, it's supposed to be um, uh, catalyzing these these fertilizations across disciplines rather than sort of firmly entrenching people in a single one. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I mean, as you'll remember, I tried my hardest not to major in anything here, mm -hmm. and I didn't. I just try to make people do like independent studies with me about museum stuff and, and not major in anything, and that's ended up serving me well because I've ended up having to be sort of be a Jill of all trades in, in a lot of my institutions. Um, Training as a material anthropologist definitely changed um, my attitude towards objects. I mean, I think this idea of, of that museums have really ignored is you walk in and you're like, this object comes from this area and this is what it means. Or you do a formal analysis and you, um, you did some very good critiques of my lack of formal analysis training in some early art history papers I remember very well. And I was like, oh man, I don't know how to do this. I need to work on this. Um, but I think coming from a material culture background, this idea of following an object through time and the ways that different people have used it. And so, you know, a doll that's manufactured in Germany might be used um, as an Akuaba doll in, in, um, in Africa. And that's a totally different context. This idea of the changing context of objects through their spaces is really important in my own practice and I think I really do wish that that was something that that um, art history and anthropology shared more back and forth with one another sometimes it's that's definitely influenced me but um, to say something maybe a little bit bombastic I mean I think that PhDs are increasingly um, irrelevant in the museum field <laughs> I can say that because I don't have a PhD <laughs> But I mean, I do think that I, I do think it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the future because PhDs train you to be a professor and they train you um, to write academic writing that doesn't really look a lot of times like the writing that um, um, is on a museum wall. Right now, I'm editing labels by an academic uh, exhibit on the apocalypse and medieval art with lots of loans from uh, the Met and the Walters and great institutions, and they need a lot of editing because <laughs> there's this, it's not like museum writing. So I mean, I I I. I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question there at all, but I do think it'll be really interesting to see what training looks like in the future um, for future museum professionals. And um, I do think at the end of the day, it's still the work in museums that really prepares you best to do the work in museums. And so, of course, now it means that we need to do the next thing, which is to pay the people that work for us. Yeah, pay the interns. <laughs> one, one more. Oh, one more. Oh, there was a question in the back, Carrie, and then we'll end with when you in the front. So, Carrie. Hello, um, I'm a classmate of Trisha's. Sorry, Trisha, I took your internship. <laughs> um, yeah, I knew that. I knew it. It was you and Gail. I remember. I knew. <laughs> I just had one um, one comment and a question. Um, the comment I had would be to challenge the idea that standalone museums cannot. And, um, be institutions of open learning for their communities. Um, I re was recently at the Museum of, of Northern Arizona, and um, it's an example of a, a museum that was deeply committed to educating its community on a regular basis, brought in um, tribal members from around the community, had a very strong partnership with um, the local university. And so I would just encourage anyone around here who is with um, a standalone museum to not think that because you are, you can't open your collections and, and really commit to using your collection as a teaching tool. 
And then my question is, I've never having worked in an academic museum, um, this might especially go to Kat, um, when you are getting so much of your funding um, from the state and from government, um, are you ever pre um, kind of subject to political leanings um, from a funding perspective? Is it held over you? I mean, that's one thing. When you were saying you've got all this freedom, I was always thinking at standalone museums we had so much freedom because we're not beholden to any uh, government funding. Uh, we're pulling that from the community. So I would just be very interested in all of your um, comments on that. I think interests of time, we'll let's just have Kat, and I think there's one more question in the front. So. Oh yeah, sure. Well, I'd be interested to hear what other people here say about that. Do we have um, time to keep on talking, John, or not? No. But um, <laughs> but but yet, I currently I do not I do not find that we have a lot of um, limitations put on us by the state of Tennessee, who technically, you know, the legislature is is over our um, our school. Um, I will be curious to see, because in the past they've done things like ban sex week at our um, university. So it'll be really interesting to see when I work, I'm working right now on an LGBTQ um, um, history project. It's called Voices Out Loud with the libraries and putting those archives on display in our museum. I'll be really interested to see what happens. Um, but th to be honest, our university doesn't f I mean, we, we rely on private funding a lot as well. Um, they only partially fund us, and so I do think that that plays into it as well. That's a short answer, but it, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's sometimes it's a misconception how much funding um, academic exactly. museums get from their parent institutions. Exactly. So actually, <laughs> at Smith as well, I think it's it's definitely under half of our operations. Yeah, uh, well. our, our director's doing a lot of fundraising all the time. So that just to, to provide a little more of the picture there behind the scenes. Yeah. And hats off to John for doing what, what he does here at Dartmouth and raising all the funds. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. We're going to take a 15-minute break. We have coffee upstairs. Coffee. Uh, so we'll see you back in about 15 oh, minutes. Thank you. Your talk was fantastic. Thank you so much. You too. Oh, thank you.